Thank you, Mr. Vice President, and thank you to all my really great colleagues. Um, can I have that my next slide? So I, I wanted to start by where we are today and just to visit where we've come in such a short period of time. As everyone on the stage has said before, um, our testing right now is well over 3.78 million tests that have been completed. And if you are impressed by bar graphs, that's over 1.2 million tests reported just in the last week. Ambassador Burks talked to me a little earlier, and she said, you know, we only do about 2 million molecular tests a year for HIV, something that's been done for, developed for 35 years. We're now doing twice that number of tests in a month for a disease that has never been known before, that there's never been a test developed before, and that's sort of where we are and where we've ramped up. I also want to give you a little idea. The uh, lighter blue or lighter gray um, is, is our, uh, our ID now tests. So um, we talk about them a lot uh, because they are a point of care test that can be between five and 15 minutes. And they have a very specific role, but they're not for everybody. If you've got to screen a few thousand people, uh, four tests an hour doesn't get you there on a machine. You have to use some of the larger, higher throughput uh, items. But they have a very important role. And again, coming into the market at 50,000 per day is really an important adjunct to us. Um, she talked about the gene expert from Cephi. It very important. We don't talk about that very much, but it is one of the backbone mo mobile point of care, not as easy to do, per se, as the Abbott, but it is a point of care test that really carries tuberculosis screening all through Africa. Um, there are these machines, you saw that on her slide. Every one of the 50 states has this in over 600 sites, and they've done over 700,000 tests just on that relatively low uh, throughput but very important platform. Next slide, please. Um, I wanted to give you an idea of sort of how the tests are distributed and, and how they're changing over time. Uh, on the left are the state public health laboratories. And although their numbers are relatively small, about 350,000, the state public health laboratories are absolutely critical. They're, they're an absolutely critical core component of our testing. Um, not only were they there early and first, but they also do things like support outbreak investigations in nursing homes or investigations in certain plants that have a close proximity with everyone because of their work environments. They also do testing on many people who do not have the opportunity to be tested elsewhere. And they are performing outstandingly well. ACLA, I know we hate acronyms, but the American Clinical Laboratory Association. This is America's commercial industrial backbone that we're standing behind the president and the vice president and, and when I was there a few weeks ago in, in the Rose Garden. This is the LabCorp, the Quest, the Bioreference Laboratory, Mayo, uh, Sonic, and ARUP. And you'll see they've done uh, almost 2.3 million tests. This is the very large high throughput machines uh, that Dr. Burks talks about. And, and I want to be clear about, about this group is that it doesn't matter where you are. Uh, I just took one of the largest labs and I said, map out for me um, where you are with, with it, within 10 miles of where you are, every site in the country. And when you do that, within 10 miles of a site of one of these, 93% of the U.S. population is covered. These are truly national reference labs that cover almost everybody within the United States. So if you cannot get a test at your hospital, the chances are overwhelming that you could send this to these labs that are fully caught up now. Um, they have no backlog of tests. They've ramped up their production. So their turnaround time is about 48 hours because you may need to transport it from um, the middle of America uh, out to a, a lab and result that. But that's really very, very, very good. Um, the American Hospital Association also academic labs. As the Vice President and the President have said, um, as more and more uh, labs come online, uh, they're increasing the amount of testing that are done just at the hospitals or at academic, academic medical centers, uh, now almost at 600,000 uh, tests. And again, matching the other slide I had, uh, the Abbott point of care test, just to give you a distribution. And that point of care test is being used um, very importantly uh, in very select populations where a point of care test is really needed. 
Uh, that could be in some hospitals where someone needs to know exactly if a person is positive or not to go on a clinical trial or in a nursing home investigation or sometimes uh, to get people screened to go back into the work environment. Most people don't need a point of care test. In fact, a point of care test does not, cannot replace the millions of tests that are here on the other side. Next slide. Um, I don't know how interested you are in swabs. I did not know a whole lot of swabs before a few weeks ago. But uh, there's two points I want to make with, with these slides is, yes, there have been constraining elements. And they're constrained for a couple reasons. Number one, because this is an unprecedented scale up of this type of very sophisticated molecular test that has never put a demand on a system like we have. When we started out a few weeks ago, there's very specific one type of swab, only get it one place in the U.S., one place in Italy. Uh, and we were stuck with that for a while because it's not just the quantity, it's the quality. What I don't want to do is put a lot of things in the system to make people believe that this is a good test when it hasn't been validated by the FDA to say that a positive is a positive and a negative is a negative. But over the past weeks, um, both the scientific community, the Gates Foundation, academic medical centers, the FDA have really opened up our ability to not stick that all the way back in your nasopharynx, but do the anterior nose and to greatly broaden the amount of swab types that are available. So we are really at a point right now that over the next, by the end of April, we'll put another five million swabs in addition to everything that's out there now, and by the end of May, uh, over 12 million new swabs in the system, more than enough to, to obtain the capacity that we need. Next slide. For these molecular tests, you take a swab and you stick it in a test tube and that test tube has to have a specific kind of liquid in it. And when we started, it was viral transport media, a very special kind of media. Uh, the CDC has a make your own recipe. If you're interested in cooking, you could probably do that. But it has a lot of ingredients that go in there, but still very limiting. Um, we've worked with many, many different laboratories. We've worked with the FDA. So now PBS, phosphate buffered saline, uh, a kind of just uh, laboratory grade salt water can be used for this. This greatly opens the ability to expand the test to support all the capability that Dr. Burks uh, talks about. And again, by the end of April, we will have put uh, well over 5 million new tubes of either viral transport media or saline into the system. I'm, I am going to get to a conclusion here, but this was going to be more of a, a technical briefing. Next slide. So um, let's talk about the fact that the science tells us that we have and will continue to have enough tests to safely uh, go into phase one. So let me be very granular about this. We've already heard that it is beyond the possibility to test everyone in this country every day. It's, just, it's not possible. But it's also a bad strategy because testing a person now just means they're negative now. Dr. Fauci could be positive tomorrow because it's brewing in his system right now and we don't know it, or that he contacts that. That's not the way we go about things. The way we go about things is, as Dr. Redfield said, just, just think of the weather radar, okay? If the weather radar is clear, you're not gonna have a thunderstorm or tornado. When something pops up, that's when you've gotta to go to where the action is or know that your warning system is up. So sort of think of that in the background, and I'll go specifically about that. So that's monitoring. Let me talk about how much testing we need just for overall testing. I'm just going to give you a number. I'm not saying that this is the number that's there. But let's just take a number that we are going to enter phase one when there are 200,000 new cases per month in the United States. Don't get hung up on that. It's going to be much less than that. But let's just say 200,000 cases. So how many tests do we need? Well, we need to test those 200,000 people to make the diagnosis, right? Everybody nod your head about that. We have to do that. Now, what's a safe number over that? You know, if everybody I test has the disease, I'm not testing enough, right? But if I test 100 people to have one person with the disease, that's probably over testing. So we kind of assume that a safe number that really gives us a good idea is if about one out of 10 people are positive, then we know we're oversampling the population enough that we're getting all the positives. So if there's 200,000 cases, I need about 2 million tests, okay? 
Now to go to Dr. Redfield's point. Each one of those that are positive have contacts that need to be traced. And on average, the CDC tells me that for every positive, there are about five contacts that really need to be traced. So let's assume that those 200,000 people have five contacts, so now we have an extra million tests. So two million tests out there to detect the 200,000 cases, an extra million out there to trace those contacts. So we're up to about three million cases. If you want to put a fudge factor, say that's four million tests, okay? Those are generally done at the main hospital labs, the commercial labs, state and regional labs. All this can be done, as well as some of the labs uh, talked about by Dr. Burks. Next slide. The second group of testing fits exactly perfectly with the influenza-like surveillance system that Dr. Redfield talked about. This is the monitoring. This is sort of the radar, uh, the weather radar that it would be out there that we're not testing people who are symptomatic. We want to do testing on people who are asymptomatic because you can have asymptomatic carriage. Yeah, you know, you could, you could have this virus and shed it and not have symptoms or only mild symptoms. So what is the strategy here? The strategy here, this is an unprecedented strategy, okay? This is, this is really unprecedented. But we're going to do um, pro between three and 500,000 tests per week in the most vulnerable populations that we know that the virus could circulate. And what are they? Number one, nursing home and long-term care facilities. We know that from the history of this, of this virus, that that can circulate and be devastating. And it could circulate even in a way that you don't have symptoms. So we're going to survey in a very uh, controlled way, driven by the CDC, supervised by the CDC, um, surveys over uh, it, we may not get to everyone, but surveying in the areas to cover in a selective way the 15,000 or so nursing homes. Secondly, um, we want to work in vulnerable members uh, in cities. And this is the way we think about that is community health centers. I, I'm a huge fan of community health centers that are led by HRSA. Um, there, are, uh, there are about 30,000 uh, community health center sites. They take care of 30 million people, children, adults, elderly. They care for about one-third of Americans below the poverty level. They are arrayed to take care of our most vulnerable populations. So we want to survey um, asymptomatic people in those community health centers. We also want to do in some of our indigenous population, and you know very early I was out here bringing machines to the Indian Health Service, and in fact, 1,800 members of the Public Health Service provide care uh, to the Indian Health Service, and their director and chief medical officer are both admirals in the Indian Health Service. Plus work workplace monitoring, particularly for workplace environments that uh, may have very close contact or may have a high risk, and some of those could be agricultural facilities. So let's just total that up. We have 200,000 people who need a diagnosis. To make that diagnosis, we want to test 2 million. Okay, so that's two million. We're going to contact trace with a million. And let's just throw you a fudge factor of about 25% on that, so that's four million. And we have this background testing of about 400, uh, of about 400,000 per month. So to safely do the testing, we need to be in the range of four and a half million. You followed my numbers, because I want you to understand per month for that, phase one. pardon me? For phase one. For phase one, right, for phase one. Um, and I want to tell you that's really how it adds up and that's where we are. Right now we're doing about one, 1 million to 1.2 million per week. We are going to continue to push that farther and further as we open up the laboratories and we're able to open all the supplies that we need for that. Um, and I, th I think that's where I would like to end. Thank you.